and you can identify this as the species, or the genus, I should say. So we're going to look at uh, 1242 uh, and 1244. We're going to talk about them together, Wisteria floribunda, Wisteria sinensis. Um, there was a question I posed to the other class, and I'll pose it to you guys. Which way do each of the species twine? So your vines twine a certain way, and vice versa. Have you looked it up yet? Okay, don't, don't, don't tell them. Don't tell them. I want them to look it up. You see, this is, so when you get those, well, you've just done your instructional feedback surveys, and every one of you has said that you use DER, right? Every year, people say, well, we don't, we don't use DER. Well, you've got to open the book and have a look. So, if we look at these vines, you can see, what, one, what is the first concern when you look at these plants? When you look at this vine right here, this vine right behind Tanner here, what is the first concern with looking at this? The size of it? Yes, the size of it. So this is not something, and I've seen this happen, you know, you buy those little white vinyl arbors, and you put them in the garden, and you put them halfway down the garden to divide the vegetable garden from the main garden, and you send Grandma out to get some peas for dinner, and she never comes back, because she walked onto the vinyl arbor, and it fell and collapsed and crushed her because you planted a wisteria vine right beside the vinyl arbor and it just overwhelms it. If you look at the website and look at the size of the stem of an older specimen, this is a relatively young one, on the website I've taken a picture of a stem of wisteria this big. So you can see this imperative that you put it on a good structure. And that's probably the biggest criticism with I see people growing wisteria is they don't put it in a place where it gets enough support. And so sometimes you can actually see it pulling apart porches this is where vines get a bad rap, because they say, well, vines destroy buildings. Well, no, if, if a vine can destroy your building, there's something wrong with your building. Right? <laughs> so with wisteria, the moral is make sure it's well supported. And here we've done a six by six arbor to keep it up. There's another problem with wisteria that everybody talks about is that it doesn't flower. If I'm talking at a conference or a garden show or you know, and, and wisteria happens to be in flower, because when it is in flower, it is absolutely, positively spectacular. Go to the website, look at a couple of images. There's one there where it's on the side of a building at Wakehurst Place, which is the Royal Botanic Gardens queue. It's there where their seat bank is, and I used to sit beside that and have lunch. It was right outside the, the they converted the old stable into a cafeteria, and it's just spectacular when it's in bloom. We have one in the Cuddy Gardens that goes over the entire arbor and it flowers and the panicles drop below the structure and they're about this big and they look like icicles. So it's really, really stunning in flower. But there's a problem. People are impatient. So the, the inevitable question is, my wisteria doesn't flower. <coughs> the question is, what do you do to it? Well, I'm feeding it and watering it regularly. Well, that's great. Plants are smart. They're not going to flower if you're feeding it and watering it, right? They're going to put on vegetative growth. So that's the first thing you stop doing. Get the plant established and then stop any kind of, you know, preferential treatment. And then the other thing that you've got to wait for is time. Wisteria take time to flower. And then the final thing is to prune it properly. Wisteria need to be pruned twice a season. And uh, I'll show you a wisteria over in D courtyard later, which is still in leaf, and you'll see how much it grows in a year. Uh, three, four meters of growth in a year. So that growth needs to be controlled to force the buds to develop. So you prune it once in June, July, removing most of that new growth back to about 12 to 14 buds. And then you prune it in February, and this is on current season's growth, back to four buds. So it's a massive pruning process to get this vine to uh, function. The next thing you would do during pruning, especially during the February pruning, is you would be up there and you would be tying the stems down to the arbor with soft garden twine. Now Lucas does this at Cuddy's. He actually lays boards and crawls across the arbor and ties it down. And that ensures that the branches are tight to the top of the arbor. And so when it does flower, those buds, the flower buds and the flower panicles are going to drop through the arbor. There's no point in having flowering on stems way up above there. We're not going to see them. So it takes a bit of work to get this plant to, uh, to function. 
when it is in flower, it is well worth it. It is absolutely, positively incredible. It is also grown in a standard form, and a standard form is where you train a vine up and you give it a support and grow it like a tree, or those hideous things they produce in garden centers where they graft things on a stick. You know, but wisteria is nice because it, it, it flows. We have a standard in, in the Louise Weeks garden, and that's another way of growing it in the landscape without using an arbor or support. There is this old fallacy that if you root prune a wisteria, it'll force it to flower. And root pruning is going around a portion of the base of the plant with a sharp shovel or spade, cutting into the soil and cutting off the roots. And the old fallacy was that, well, that will put the plant under stress. And if a plant is under stress, then it will flower because it wants to produce seed to perpetuate itself. But when you think of the actual process of actually severing a plant's roots, there are some issues there. And the, you know, in my experience, I've determined that there's no benefit in severing roots other than, you know, you're not going to get it to flower any better than proper pruning techniques and waiting for the plants to progress. Okay? Pests and diseases, few and far between. Wisteria does need full sun, so it's got to be grown in a full sun. It can be trained directly on walls, flat to walls, kind of in espalier fashion. It takes a lot of work, though, because you can see how vigorous this vine is. <laughs> so um, it, it is a plant that you need to use with caution, but it's one of the few I think is worth it because of the bloom. Questions? Oh, yes, seed pods. There was a seed pod here. It is gone. Did someone take it? I thought we did. Took it first. We took it on Monday. Oh, did we? Yeah. <laughs> is there another one up there? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's one? right there up against it, isn't it? Where is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's there. It's there. I don't know if you can see it, Dave. Can you zoom out? It's right on the 2 by 4 It's just twisted. It. Part of it. Okay, someone pointed out. So, Dave, yeah, right there. Yeah, right there. That's the seed pod. So, it does produce these seed pods. You know, little like beans, and they open up to reveal a, a deep brown uh, seed. And those are very silky. And they start off very green, so actually they're, I think they're quite attractive. And then they twist to release the seed, right? But you want to pet them when they're, when they're, because they're really like fuzzy, like <laughs> hamsters. <laughs> My uh, and they don't bite. What does espalier mean? Espalier means to train something up against the wall. It's a very old Victorian technique, and they use it in Victorian gardens to grow tender fruit crops, because a wall is a radiant heat, heat sink. And you can grow an apple tree against the wall, espaliering it, and it doesn't take up a lot of room. Roughly, do you, should I Google it, or do you roughly know how to spell it? E-S-P-A-L-I-E-R. <laughs>